Check this shit out. If you've been to my channel before, you've probably seen more than a few sweeping shots of my game collection. Part of it is just filler when I need imagery to go along with something NES related, but I realize that this is kind of how I personally browse through them. I probably spend more time running my eyes back and forth along the shelves, just picking up random games for a few seconds, than I do actually playing the cartridges. It's hard to explain, but it's surprisingly fun. Like all the time I'll be browsing and go, hmm, Starship Hector? What the hell is that? Oh yeah, that's what it is. Anyway, what else? As such, I've spent a lot of time gazing at the games and analyzing their cover art. Every title in the NES library is at least somewhat compelling, either as a bland attempt, an incredibly detailed rendering, or my favorites, these straight up uggos. Oh yeah, that's the stuff. Something I've really grown to appreciate are the really bad NES games. Just the poorly made, boring, barely playable titles for the system. And the icing on that shitty cake is when the publishers gave these stinkers good artwork. Like they knew exactly what they were doing. How else were they going to move these complete strikeouts without embellishing a bit with the packaging? With a great appreciation for that top level of con artistry, here are 10 terrible NES games with amazing cover art. I'll mostly be talking about the artwork itself more than the game, but some of these really do warrant a closer look, so stay tuned, I'll probably do reviews of a few of these in the future. In no particular order, let's start off with a classic, Deadly Towers. This warrior is the epitome of fantasy awesomeness and adolescent projection. Super buff muscles, shiny armor and weapons, confident knee-up stance revealing the mysteries between the loincloth. Aside from the well-drawn figure, the watercolor hues surrounding the titular Deadly Towers do a great job of creating a dark, ominous vision of what's ahead for our hero. The in-game character looks like a child trick-or-treating as a rhinoceros. The backgrounds feature bland, clashing colors with little texture or definition. Even worse, the level design is like an overly ambitious Legend of Zelda, a confusing maze of interconnected screens with no map. It's awkward, repetitive, unintuitive, and just a great big tub of no fun. So yeah, you'd be hard pressed to see this amazing heavy metal level of presentation on the cover and actually believe the game was gonna look this good, but damn, they got us. Here's an obscure one, Stanley, the search for Dr. Livingston. The winner for the, wait, what is this? And why was it ever made? Award always goes to Stanley, the search for Dr. Livingston. But surely some copies were sold based on that cover alone. For the NES, this is a truly unique design, incorporating photography, illustration, and some primitive Photoshop-like effects, creating a neat collage. Stanley does have a lot of charm for what it is, but overall it just lacks polish. The enemies take way too many hits to kill, the map is confusing to navigate, and the backgrounds are a muddled mess. It's kind of an adventure game as showcased with all the Zelda 2 style town sections, but it's a false front. Most of the game is spent figuring out what can or cannot be climbed, while forest creatures relentlessly pummel Stanley to death. At first glance, nothing about the Stanley cartridge makes me want to play it, but then the longer you stare at it and kind of absorb its bizarre atmosphere and reluctant, nerdy protagonist, the more it convinces you that this will be some rewarding Star Tropics-like experience. It won't be, but in that way, I think this cover was successful in its design. Next is one of my favorite movies, but least favorite games, Conan. Conan amps up the over-the-top fantasy aesthetic of Deadly Towers even further. Here, Conan stands shirtless, split-legged across a crumbling cliffside, flames blazing behind him, holding a sword and a shield that somehow both attracts and repels lightning. This dude is definitely out to hear the lamentations of the women. It's reminiscent of work by famed fantasy illustrator Boris Vallejo, and must surely advertise what will be an action-packed fantasy adventure. Unlike the bulking professional wrestler on the cover, in-game Conan is ever so teeny tiny. The colors and backgrounds are only a slight step above Game Boy level quality. Pressing the A or B buttons cause Conan to meekly paw his enemies, while up or down will cause Conan to jump in a floating arc across the screen. 
Needless to say, fighting enemies and navigating platforms make playing this game a total nightmare. Overall, this shit looks badass. Overtly homoerotic, but badass for sure. I especially love the title with the ancient font and the sword crossing through it. Hell yeah. Oh boy. Time to meet my nemesis, Dr. Chaos. Immediately, that winged skeleton paints an image of foreboding horror. Upon closer inspection, the tiny monsters in the background are just as intimidating and even more grotesque. This guy is either bleeding profusely or is just letting the blood of his enemies slide off his hands and pool in front of him. This demon is scratching his ass. Whatever this is definitely came to party. And holy shit, is that a testicle monster with a syringe stuck in his head? What the fuck? Nightmare stuff. In-game, Dr. Chaos bears more in common with Goonies 2 than Castlevania, featuring platforming that shifts to first-person point-and-click upon entering a door. However, Dr. Chaos took this formula and murdered it, placing over 20 doors on the first screen alone. Most of these lead nowhere, yield little, and always end with this unnecessarily hard mini-boss fight. God, I wish this were a better game, because this cover is amazing. Everything from the drawing style, to the characters, to the fisheye-like perspective where Dr. Chaos is both close and far away from the viewer. Amazing. Many NES covers were well painted, but few are this well composed, and frankly terrifying in a way that for sure makes you want to play it, if you're bold enough. And since we can't exclude the ladies from this mess, it's Athena. If you were a kid who loved Greek myths, this cover would hook you for sure. There's a centaur, a mermaid, some, um, huts? And a screaming Medusa that all convey ancient wonder and excitement. The characters are drawn in two color tones, creating a simple but graphic look. While every game on this list has exceptional font choices, Athena's 80s color fade and looping letters are especially funky, almost graffiti-esque. Unfortunately, Athena is a monotonous platformer that lacks the wonder it projects. If Athena was swapped out for any sprite, like say, a giant rabbit, you could call this Bugs Bunny's Adventures in Forest Land, and it would work just as well. It's not the worst title of its kind, but it has all the classic sins, like poor jumping, endlessly respawning enemies, uneven hit detection, and straight up boring, frustrating gameplay. The thing that really gets me about this otherwise perfectly stylized cover is this little blurb, Japan's top arcade hit. While I never knew Athena was an arcade title, I know for sure they're taking some license with the word top here. That feels like a hard stretch. Here's a weird one, Power Punch 2, the official but most definitely unofficial sequel to Mike Tyson's Punch Out. I will definitely do a whole bit on this game in my obscure sequels to popular NES game series at some point, as it's pretty interesting. But after the whole dropping Mike Tyson from the Punch-Out name, Nintendo left the series alone until the SNES came out. However, the NES was not done with Tyson, and the Australian company Beam Software created this bad boy originally titled Mike Tyson's Intergalactic Power Punch. After Tyson went to prison, the name got changed again, and so Mike Tyson is now Mark Tyler. Seamless. The game plays nothing like Punch-Out. Instead of the pattern recognition rhythm style of the original, Power Punch 2 goes for a more traditional slug it out boxing game. There's a little training section before each fight where you're sparring, and if you do well here it boosts your stats going forward. I'm terrible at it, and as such proceed to get wiped by the cyborg dude. It's incredibly dry, slogging gameplay with no real strategy, and thus, no fun. All that being said, if you'd shown this to me in 1992, it'd immediately have been in my hand on the way of the checkout register. I mean, the premise is Punch-Out in space. How cool is that? This is really solid rendering and posing of Tyson, a perfect font ripped straight off a creatine powder bottle, and of course, I just love the motley crew of alien boxers they design. I'm not much of a fighter myself, but if I were Mark Tyler, I'd definitely punch all these dudes in the face. Next is the legend itself, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. It may appear a bit cheesy by today's standards, but in 1988, 
this cover would have scared all the kids out of Blockbuster. The expression on his face is harrowing, and the makeup, lighting are perfectly utilized. Those teeth! Gah! Based on this cover, there's no way one can anticipate the true horror that lies inside. One part of the game follows Jekyll in the real world, and as Hyde, a totally different style of gameplay takes place. While the Hyde section is a sort of decent scrolling shooter, the Jekyll part is a banal walk to the right that barely qualifies as a game. Jekyll is completely defenseless and so slow that avoiding damage from the seemingly innocuous townspeople is near impossible to do. This title has been propelled into the shitty stratosphere by other pundits who have proclaimed it one of the worst NES games ever, and in this case, that's the correct assessment. It blows. Big time. Offhand, I can't really think of any other photograph covers like this at the time. I'm sure I'm missing one, but as terrible as this game is, the choice to shoot a real model with this grotesque costuming and face paint was really smart. Sitting on a Toys R Us shelf, you'd immediately gravitate right to its bright colors and creepy character design. Look out! It's Ghoul School! The perspective places the player at the base of the steps, creating anticipation for the huge adventure lying inside. The CMYK palette is used with great effect here, giving this cover the look of an R-rated movie you never knew existed. Also, what is this horror in the window above the entrance? It looks like a T-Rex went through the teleportation pods from the fly. Goo School has a lot of potential, an offbeat adventure game filled with unique sprite designs in a quirky setting. However, the game's controls just suck the joy out of this. The poor hit detection is made all the more frustrating by the fact that while you get bounced back when hit, the enemies do not, which leads to a lot of cheap damage. But again, it has potential, and while I can't stand Ghoul School, this is probably the only title on this list that some people might defend. And while I will start some shit over Dr. Chaos or Conan, relax, I'm willing to be convinced on this one. Every time I look at this cover, I really marvel at it. How did they make this in 1992? I use Photoshop for all my design stuff, but in 1992, all I had was MS Paint. The rays here in the sky, the tones of the school, this fade-in effect on the title, and especially the way they added in all these details in the windows. It's really impressive. Probably the worst game of the group, and that's saying a lot, Bad Street Brawler. Whoa! This surfer dude punched someone so hard, they flew through the cover itself? Damn! Also, check out the background. Is that a gorilla calmly posted up on the sidewalk? What are the two guys on the right doing? It's either a robbery in progress, a complex kid in play style dance routine, or a subculture of dating that involves couples wearing handcuffs in public. The in-game brawler looks like a blonde gym teacher who hangs out at the beach and buys beer for high school kids. This is only one of a few games designed for the infamous Power Glove, which should say a lot. With the unresponsive accessory, Bad Street Brawler is tedious, frustrating, and extremely difficult. With the regular controller, it's monotonous, boring, and extremely easy. At the top here it says Power Glove Gaming Series, which is a feature unique to the cover of this game and one other, Super Glove Ball. It's really a shame the Power Glove didn't really work, as in theory it could have led to way better games than these two, but oh well, them's the breaks. Finally, let's talk about The Adventures of Tom Sawyer. This artwork wouldn't be that out of place as a book cover. It really does a great job of conveying the excitement and danger of being a child free of responsibilities. Look at the expression on the children's faces. Tom looks like he's excited about upcoming rapids. Becky looks like she found something cool in the alligator's throat. And Huckleberry Finn looks like he's about to sashay away. Expecting a wild adventure? Well, Adventures of Tom Sawyer is here to disappoint. Featuring bland colors, basic sprites, and uninspired backgrounds, this game would have been more at home on earlier consoles like the ColecoVision. Filled with awkward jumping, an arcing projectile that's difficult to aim, and one-hit deaths, more fun would surely have been had painting that fence. Speaking of which, I love that they chose the famous whitewashed picket fence from the story to create the title. That is perfectly designed for a Tom Sawyer game. I am though a little confused by this subtitle, Action Packed High Adventure with Tom Sawyer. 
Um, yeah. It's called The Adventures of Tom Sawyer. We've already covered that. Maybe they meant to put Huckleberry Finn here? I don't know. And that's it. I'm sure I missed some pretty juicy ones. So if y'all can think of other terrible games that had great covers, just leave it in the comments and maybe I'll come back and do a part two. In the meantime, I will eventually do a inverse of this where it's great games for the system that had terrible artwork, but we'll see when I get to that. Until then, thanks for watching.